Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. Well, this is it. This is election day. We've been doing a countdown. It's been, you know, 70 days to the election, 60 days to the election. And it, it's, it is right here. And America's already feeling great again. We're having a new unscalable wall built at the White House. They've boarded up all of Washington, D.C. So things are going well, I guess. So we are joined on the line by Kevin Williamson of National Review and, and of many things. And well, first of all, w- w- welcome, welcome to the podcast on what's going to be a pretty wild and crazy day, I'm thinking. Yeah, I think, um, you know, as I was saying before, I think I'm going to need to take a nap at some point. I remember the uh, 2016 election and uh, I was watching Fox News and it's the only time I ever watched stuff like that and watching the states come in. And right around the time it looked like Pennsylvania was going to go for Trump, I switched it over to MSNBC. Uh, just because I enjoy the kind of Al Qaeda hostage video quality of the uh, of the expressions on everyone's face right then, and I was obviously not very happy about seeing Donald Trump elected president of the United States of America, but I understand that kind of you know partisan animal spirit at least on election night because it was kind of fun to watch. Hillary Clinton lose. Well, there's going to be a lot of schadenfreude. And, and by the way, you you mentioned uh, that I, I probably will be on MSNBC at least briefly tonight. And we're also mm-hmm. doing a live stream for the bulwark. And it occurred to me that that means there'll be a record of my face when things happen. You know, <laughs> like, la- last time I'm, I'm just I'm sitting, um, you know, doing the doom scrolling thing and looking at that that damn New York Times needle. But they're bringing back the freaking needle. Kevin, mm. does anybody in the world want the needle back? I mean, anyone? There are a lot of people I think are candidates that we should give the needle to. Yeah, oh, but um, I'm uh, I'm not so sure about uh, about the New York Times needle. Although, honestly, um, this may be a real change in the kind of media environment. Uh, I'm a New York Times subscriber. I generally like the New York Times outside of political news, which they do a pretty bad job on. But um, do you go there on election night? I don't go to the New York Times on election night typically. You know, I don't know where I'm going on election night. I mean, the, the, there are so many different places to go. In fact, that's one of the things I have to figure out today, uh, what the strategy will be. Generally, I think that the the best option is to go to people who are really knowledgeable, who really know how to read the results and then follow them on Twitter. Yeah. Because the, you know, when, when, when a result comes in, you, you know, this saying, well, you know, you know, X percent of the voter in in Florida and so and so is leading unless you know exactly where those votes are coming from, what county, what percentage of the votes from that county, um, what the expectations were for that county, what the targets were. The numbers are absolutely meaningless, but there are there are wonks out there and you can follow those wonks. So I'm I'm going to I'm going to do a wonk search later this afternoon. No, that's good. I don't really do the Twitter thing, so um I will. Um, I will not be doing that. But uh, maybe I'll. Uh, where will I check in? This is kind of my tradition. It, this is my uh, one year of the night to watch television, uh, at least oh, to watch cable, cable news. I always tell people, even when I was in New York and I used to be on Fox News a lot, I've never watched a Fox News program all the way through, <laughs> and uh, I don't expect that I probably ever will. I think they're going to be talking about the gypsy threat tonight. Or you know. I have some cousins in uh, Eastern Europe, and they are just horrifying on the subject of gypsies. Um, gypsy prejudice is a, is a real thing in the world, apparently, still, but it's it's a European thing. Well, it's a big thing on Tucker Carlson, and you, you can always you can always tell when things are getting a little bit difficult because he's going to sh- shift to the gypsies. Okay, so um, b- before we get into the the, the really the the heavy duty punditry today, um, and and how we feel about all of this, uh, the the president who's been on this whirlwind tour, uh, called into Fox News. He was here in my home state of Wisconsin, where he spent a great deal of time. He came into Kenosha last night. And as far as I can tell from social media, he spent most of the time complaining about the quality of his microphone and threatening not to pay the vendors because the microphone was so shitty. So, hey, so that that's the way. And then he was also attacking Bon Jovi. That, you know, every I, time he meets I, Bon I Jovi, think bon... microphone's a hard way to get a Reagan moment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. OK, so he calls in to Fox and Friends this morning, which is his safe space, a safe space. And I'll, I'll, I'll let I'll let people decide what what how they think he sound. OK, so this is Election Day. This is the most the important day of his life. This is the day that will determine whether or not he is a one term president. And here's President Donald Trump calling into Fox and Friends. 
So, Mr. President, the analysis of what they're talking about and some of the things you've said, they are suggesting that you may declare victory if the early numbers favor you. At what point will you declare victory? When there's victory. If there's victory, I think I think we'll have victory. I think the, the polls are, you know, suppression polls, and I think we'll have victory, but only when there's victory. I mean, you know, there's no reason to play games. And I think we'll have victory. I think, we're, you know, I look at it as being a very— um, you know, a very solid chance at winning. I don't know what the chances are. I don't know how they rate the chances, but I think we have a very solid chance of winning. Kevin Williamson, low energy. I mean, <laughs> really low energy. Yeah, we know he uh, doesn't drink, but that's kind of what I sound like when I've, when I've had about six. Um, you know, it's funny that he was saying he doesn't know what the chances are, because I think he's got a, a hotel in Las Vegas. He's got to know some odds makers out there. You know, mm-hmm. he knows the guy to make a phone call and uh, and talk to you about it. So, yeah, he's uh, he's always been a strange cat. He's going to be a strange cat all night tonight. And um, I think that his if he should lose his his lame duck period is going to be a real entertaining circus. Ugly. Um, Ugly. I suspect that even some of his. Uh, most sycophantic admirers are going to be happy to see him heading for the exits on uh, in, in the end of January. Well, I, I don't think he's going anywhere, but I, but but you are right. I think there's a lot of people who will be really relieved, and of course, that's going to be the fascinating, you know, question if 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 he loses. I, I must upset. I must admit, I'm I'm obsessed with the question: Is will he show up on January 20th for the inauguration? What do you think? I actually was on a radio show and and I and I hedged and fudged it and I said fifty five forty five he'll show up. I think I'm wrong. I... Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if either he or Biden um, decided not to do the uh, touchy feely post election handshakes. We're all good buddies here thing. I, Biden's going to be under tremendous pressure not to do that. Um, we well, and... got they got you got the pandemic excuse. Hey, I would do this, but uh, no. Who knows where that guy's been? Yeah, exactly. Well, you know where that guy's been. You know, you know what he's been doing. Yeah. But I'm, I'm just trying. I'm trying to imagine. You know, yeah, actually, that 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 is true. They're probably not going to do the the whole thing. But it seems to me impossible to imagine Donald Trump sitting up there watching this massive crowd, which will be way bigger than his crowd, yeah. and they will be just loving the fact that they are celebrating his defeat. There's nothing in Donald Trump's makeup that will make him say, I should do this. This is a good thing for me to do. There's no yeah. way he's coming. No way. And honestly, it might not even be safe for him to do so. Well, that that's that's also true. So look, um, I, I want to talk about your piece in, in National Review, which was uh, hell no. And uh, uh, right before we began this this, this podcast, uh, I uh, we, were, we were just, just chatting about the your book that came out in 2015, um, the case against Trump. So, I mean, you not know, a bestseller that book. Well, it wasn't this household. <laughs> I don't know if I don't know if you remember when we when we met. We actually had dinner together in mm-hmm. in in San Francisco. It was very weird. Okay, so this was at the National Review Institute or something, and yeah, I was the, I, I was this was in a different century, and I was I was the MC. And and had had your book come out yet at that point? Uh, I don't recall. Yeah, because I wanted, I was very anxious for it. I was, I was in the, I was in the camp of, come on, man. Oh, you know, that, that was, that was probably pretty late in, in 2016. So it, it had come out, but I remember really wanting it to come out. But I guess the point is that you have been at this for five freaking years. Yeah. Five years telling people who Donald Trump is, what Donald Trump means. And today is the day that that may not be the end of the Trump era, because I don't think it will be, but it's the beginning of the end of the Trump presidency, I think. So five years. Can you imagine how much time we have spent over the last five years thinking about this guy, talking about this guy, writing about this guy? Yeah, well, in fact, you know, it's funny because I'm actually not all that much of a Trumpologist. You know, I don't really write about the president all that much. Um, I did write that little book about him back in, in 16, and I do occasionally feel obliged to check in on it, but I'm not really a right about the president guy. That's not my job. I'm more of a, you know, social issues and, and, and policy guy. 
Um, and I think that you hit upon something that's going to be on my mind very much over the next few days, which is that irrespective of um, what happens with the election tonight, what Trump stands for is going to remain for some time and have to be confronted and understood and managed and dealt with in some way. And that is going to be a, um, you know, a real, a real long-term challenge. And it's going to make a lot of people not very happy. And there are a lot of, uh, I think, expectations that certain frayed relationships within the conservative movement and the Republican Party will go away after this. And uh, you know, Trump is a uniquely bad specimen, but he's not really the fundamental problem. He's not really the issue. He is, he's much more symptom. Than so what, what is the fundamental problem then? Well, it's a, it's a couple of things. It's the um, increasingly tribalistic nature of American politics, which I also wrote a little book about called The Smallest Minority, and, um, and the transformation of the president and the presidency from an administrative officer into a kind of cultural totem and chieftain, so that any time one tribe's guy is not in office and the other tribe's guy is, they have to feel excluded and humiliated and alienated from their own society. And they can't just say, well, we lost this election, uh, but the government does what the government does and life goes on. Yeah, right. Everything becomes an existential uh, confrontation. That's a big part of it. Um, and that has to do with the fact that we've had um, changes to social and family and economic life related to what we call, for lack of a better term, globalization, that have left people looking for new sources of meaning and belonging, stability in their life. And they've turned to politics and this particularly tribalistic form of partisan politics yeah. as a substitute for things like religion and family and community. It's um, no longer this is how I voted, but this is who I am. This is the sort yeah. of person I am. And if that's the sort of person you are, you know, we can't have Thanksgiving dinner together. And I don't think that problem is going away on either side. There are particular things on the right that are problems that don't have exact parallels on the left. I mean, we really do have people on the right who just have basically fundamental disagreements about what to do about things like free trade and mm -hmm. and things like that. And those are not issues that you can kind of half a loaf on very much. Um, you know, one side is going to want to prevail in those. And when one of those sides does prevail, people for whom the other view of that issue is their make or break thing. And there are people like me who really do care a whole lot about trade and who really do care a whole lot about immigration policy. Um, if they don't get their way, they're going to have very strong political incentives to go looking somewhere else. The other problem for the Republican Party, of course, and I wrote a piece about this in the Wall Street Journal this week, um, is that um, it is in decline in the parts of the country that are growing. Um, in the cities and suburbs, among the educated people, you know, where the people in the GDP and the college degrees are, uh, the Republican Party is not doing so well, which is why I think... Um, Texas isn't played tonight, and I wouldn't be. I'd, I'd be surprised if Biden won Texas, but I wouldn't be shocked. Well, well it, I almost put it the other way. You're you're a Texas guy, so you know more about this. It would be existentially shocking in American politics if Joe Biden wins Texas tonight. Yeah, I mean, I I, I just turn you around because of, because of what it represents. It, it is like the fast forward of all of the demographic issues. It's not surprising because, of course, the. Uh, the, the polls are, are, are dead, you know, are, are, are very, very tight. And there's this massive surge. So whether it's shocking or not, but yeah, the, I mean, so this is not going away. And I think people need to understand this, that, that there, the fever doesn't break, you know, simply because the tweets stop and, but, and by the way, they're not going to stop. The Republican party doesn't heal itself. So I want to talk about those, the last five years though, because it, this morning, as I was thinking back on election day, I, I went, went back and found the transcript of my, my very last appearance on Fox News. A after I went on and said this, I was never invited back again and never will be. <laughs> and this was May 2016, and everybody else was getting on board the Trump train. And I was asked by then host Megyn Kelly, who, long story there, um, why I wasn't getting on. And this is what I said. I said, Donald Trump is a serial liar, a con man who mocks the disabled and women. He's a narcissist and a bully, a man with no fixed principles, who has the vocabulary of an emotionally insecure nine-year-old. So no, I don't want to give him control of the IRS, the FBI, and the nuclear codes. That's just me. And I haven't changed my mind about this guy. In fact, yeah. the last five years feels like it's just been a gloss on all of that. So have have you been surprised by, by this? I, 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 the line that jumped out at me from your piece in National Review is the case against Trump 
is a lot like the case against Trump in 2016, but bolstered by the accumulation of evidence and experience. Yeah. Well, before I I respond to that, one point of contention, I think, which is that before I was an emotionally insecure 48-year-old, I once was an emotionally insecure nine-year-old. I think I had a better vocabulary. So that's not... um, not, I I apologize to nine-year-olds everywhere. I'm a toddler with too hard there. Yeah. So in 2016, you know, on election night and immediately thereafter, um, I had a couple of conversations with some uh, senior Republican officials, as they call themselves. And... um, The general expectation was that, you know, at some point when he gets inaugurated, Trump gets sat down and someone comes in, some, you know, Al Haig type figure Mm -hmm. and uh, gives him the what's what. You know, here's what's actually going on in the world. Here's the actual dangers we face. Um, Here are the problems domestically. Here are the problems internationally. Here are the things that are on your inbox, you know, right now. And uh, what are you going to do about it? And how can we help? And I kind of thought, that even Donald Trump's silly character as he is, would at that point sort of sober up. He would go, well, hell, I never actually expected to win this stupid thing, but now I'm president of the United States. At the very least, I don't want to embarrass myself and go down in the history books as a ridiculous buffoon, which of course is is, is what he's done instead. Maybe I should take this seriously. Uh, maybe I should um, you know, start consulting some people and listening to people who actually know about this stuff, delegate some things. And as I mentioned in the National Review piece, um, to the extent that he did that, those are the places where he was really quite successful. Yeah, federal like, society judges. Right, yeah, like punting that stuff over to um, to people who knew what they were doing, and all he has to do is say, well, you did my homework for me, thanks. I'm, yeah. I'm happy to take this list and do it. Because he's totally intellectually capable of trying to nominate Janine Pirro or Judge Judy or his sister or whoever to the Supreme Court. Um, that's his sort of normal inclination. You know, in fact, the first time he was asked about that, he suggested he would he would nominate his now estranged sister. So, um, you know, the tax bill, which has some pretty good things in it, although I think it had some, some problems as well, was largely a you know a Paul Ryan joint, and um, he has you know in deregulation things like that, more or less outsourced that stuff to responsible mm-hmm. kind of conservative ink uh, type figures although he hasn't always got that quite right either. And uh, it's the stuff that he's actually interested in and gets personally involved in that are a mess. Uh, You know, foreign relations, immigration, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, Trade, especially, um, where he's just made a hash of things and cost Americans probably hundreds of billions of dollars that will never be recovered. So, you know, people, because of this tribalistic aspect of our politics, you know, people really demand from me a lot, you know, say you'll vote for him, say you like him better than Biden. Of course, I won't say those things, or at least at least admit that he's been good for African-Americans, or at least admit this, or at least admit that. You know, it's this very, you shall admit, confessional, uh, inquisitional model of politics we're in right now. But my, my basic position here is that, you know, I'm a conservative. I'm pretty naturally inclined to support Republicans and to, uh, and to give Republican candidates the benefit of the doubt and uh, to give them a bit of leeway for being politicians and that kind of stuff. We do that. That's natural. But if you want my vote, if you want my support, you just can't ask me to vote for a corrupt buffoon who doesn't actually really agree with most of the things that I agree with, who can't do the job, who spent four years showing that he can't do the job and isn't willing to learn how to do the job and wasn't really even quite trying to do the job. Um, so if that means Biden, well, that means Biden, although I've got high hopes for Joe Jorgensen of Libertyville, Illinois. <laughs> How great is it that the Libertarian nominee was born in a city called Libertyville? It's that perfect. Is, that's well, foresight. It's, that's, it's, it, it's almost like Bill Clinton com- coming from hope, right? Hope, yeah. It was something like that. Well, you know, you know the the pushback that you get. You get the same pushback that I get, which is that oh, you're just objecting to the aesthetics. You're objecting to yeah. his personality. You're object. If it wasn't for the tweets, it okay. wouldn't be so bad. Yeah, that and elections are binary. The two great intellectually cowardly dodges of our time. You know, when you're voting for someone, you're affirming that. You're affirming that position. You're saying, "I select this person to be president of the United States of America." Um, now, you can tell yourself all day, well, I was making a lesser of two evils choice, and maybe you were. And as I've always said, um, I like Trump better than Hillary, or I like Trump better than Joe Biden, is a perfectly defensible position. 
Uh, it's a perfectly defensible position. Uh, it's not necessarily my position, but it's a, it's a perfectly respectable position. The non-respectable position is this guy's a good president. He's been good for the country. He's done great things for America. And this nonsense about he's worked harder than anyone else. He's the only man who's ever tried to keep his promises. And, uh, you know, all of this nonsense. Do, do people actually people. believe that? I, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually serious. But I hear people say things like that. And I really want to look in their eyes and go, okay, is, is somebody at home there? Do you actually believe these things? Yeah, or do you I, think you have to say these things? I spent a couple of weeks reading uh, stuff on uh, self-radicalization among yeah. Islamic militants. And, um, you know, how these people who are the sons of dentists in relatively prosperous suburbs of Cairo managed to turn themselves into suicide bombers. And I think that it's a lot like what we've seen with the sort of, you know, self-radicalization of the, of the Trump movement, which is not to say that I think these people are the moral equivalent of Al-Qaeda suicide bombers. But it is possible to work oneself up into a kind of frenzy without a lot of help from the outside. And, uh, and they do have, of course, quite a bit of help from the outside, what we, we've come to call the entertainment wing of the uh, conservative movement, the Kennedys and, and such of the world. And that is a growing, baneful influence on our, um, on our uh, public discourse. But no, I think these people are sincere about it. You know, I was talking to someone yesterday, an older guy, um, but not a complete fool. And he is just convinced that Trump is going to win 48 or 49 states tonight. He's going to win California. And he's convinced of that, not because of anything he's read or any polls or things like that, but because it's an argument that makes sense to him moralistically. So he believes that Biden doesn't deserve to win these states, therefore Biden will not. And that kind of conflation of one's own uh, moralistic preferences and um, social affiliations with reality, I think, really drives a lot of that stuff. That you're did, did, did you prepare him for disappointment? I offered to bet him twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, there's there's money on the table out there. There's if this this would be a great moment. Just like there's the pro tip: find people like this and see whether or not they're willing to put some money on it. No, it is it is interesting to me, and I I I do know what you're talking about the this alternative reality that if you're immersed in it, if you marinate in it long enough, you begin to believe it, or it becomes irrelevant whether it's true. It's just it's 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 what you. It, 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 it's like what you swim in. You know what I'm yeah. saying? It's um, and that because I, I hear people, I understand the people who will make the transactional arguments. It's the people who do the he he was the hardest working man or he is yeah. such a good man or character. Now, listen, I don't want to get you in a fight with anybody because you, you've had enough fights in your life. OK, but it's not just the entertainment wing. Um, you know, someone who we will we won't name them because they're, they're a publisher of a of a small publishing house that has published you. Um, <laughs> a serious intellectual, I mean, serious, serious, serious thinker who's actually going to figure out you're talking about. It OK, but uh, <laughs> um, who's actually written pieces saying that uh, that defending Donald Trump as a man of really good character. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing to say, I like the judges with the regulation, but how do you get to the point where you look at Donald Trump and say, this is a man of good character, a man of honesty and, yeah. uh, and, and of probity and of discretion? How do you get there? I don't know. You know, Roger is a dear friend <laughs> and um, I look, like we're, we're not naming any names. I'm not the guy that brought up Roger <laughs> Kimball's name. I did not <laughs> say Roger Kimball on this podcast. Dude, that dude, was dude, let's, let's take this away from just being Roger. I, I, that's I that's, that's all on you now, Kevin. <laughs> Happy to say that I just think he's wrong about this one. I disagree with him. And um, and that I think um, it's a pretty tough case to make and that he hasn't made it successful. Um, but in terms of your more kind of, um, you know, pointy headed uh, intellectual conservative types, I think that there's a natural tendency to be seduced by power. And um, so when someone wins election as president of the United States, they automatically get invested with this sort of awesome power that is really quite um, seductive and people find excuses and they come up with ever more unlikely arguments and justifications. And, um, you know, I, I, I want to sit them down for the you know Sunday school lesson uh, because they do think of this as a, a particularly Christian undertaking as well and remind them of Isaiah and woe unto them who call evil good and justify wickedness for profit. Uh, which I think is a lot of what's going on with some of this in some corners. Uh, some people, I think, are acting in perfectly good faith. They are grievously wrong. And um, 
and they have uh, you know sort of radicalized and worked themselves up into a position that I think they wouldn't have come to if they had taken a calmer and cooler approach. Uh, but some people are also just you know trying to sell doggy vitamins. Right. Well, that's true. But and, and we shouldn't underestimate the attraction of power. This is not a new phenomenon. I mean, in, in, in human history, um, there are a lot of throne sniffers and there have been throne sniffers for 3000 years. So this is not something that we just that we just invented here or, you know, so to a certain extent, we, you know, that's that would be the the default setting. But you make an interesting point in your article. You say, look, you know, the practical case against Trump is very simple. He stinks at his job. Yeah. And and I noticed that Henry Olson, who's been kind of Trumpy, has a great analysis over at the Washington Post why Donald Trump is going to lose tonight. This is very common sense. He's failed at his major job. Um, people look at him. Uh, he's faced his crisis of, of the coronavirus and he blew it. And what's really extraordinary about that is leaving aside all of the other stuff, all of the other stuff that you and I have written about him and we know about him. If he had gotten the coronavirus right, if he had been an effective, strong, credible leader, He'd probably be cruising to reelection because you look at other elected officials who face this and they have they've benefited politically. You know, you look at the prime minister of New Zealand. uh, There's a lot of other examples. Uh, Governors around the country have uh, their approval ratings have just spiked. Donald Trump is almost unique among among world leaders and among political leaders in being, you know, being uh, destroyed by his own failure to take this seriously. Yeah, I think that um, you're probably right about that. Um, I think that one of the things I always try to address, and I've never been successful in doing this and probably never will, but we have a basically superstitious attitude about the relationship between the president and the economy. So we think if the economy is doing well, it's because the president's smart and good. Right, right. If the economy is doing poorly, it's because he's bad and dumb. And these things are not really related quite that directly. But given the state of the economy pre- uh, epidemic, I think it's very likely that Trump would have been able to make a pretty persuasive case to himself for himself and say, look, you know, you may not like the tweets. Uh, maybe you don't like the way I talk. Uh, maybe you don't like this, that or the other, but unemployment is here. This is what wage growth has done. This is what's happened for, you know, wages, employment for African-Americans and for Hispanics and for immigrants. And, uh, you know, I'm, I've delivered results. Now, I think that argument would be bull for the most part, but it'd probably be persuasive bull. And, uh, but, you know, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And we had a pretty serious economic collapse after that. People are not in very good shape right now, including a lot of people who would probably be naturally inclined to be Trump voters. And uh, his general um, affect surrounding the response to the epidemic has been pretty troubling, I think terms of the you know dishonesty and the chaos and silliness and the obvious refusal to take it seriously and spending the first part of the uh, of the response basically treating it as a stock market problem and yeah. trying to you know tweet the markets up and that sort of thing so you know no world re- leader I think has really got it entirely right although you've seen pretty good results in places like New Zealand and Taiwan mm-hmm. but you know Angela Merkel um, did all the things I think you would expect someone in her position to do. In Germany, still didn't really quite get it right. And, uh, you know, they're suffering second wave like a lot of Europe is right now. I think that if Trump had responded to this in a way that was serious and honest and responsible, even if it wasn't entirely successful, that seriousness and honesty and responsibility would have really redounded to his benefit politically. I don't think it's so much a case of, well, we didn't lick this virus and get it under containment, and we didn't do 25 things that nobody maybe could have thought to do uh, back in January. But um, it's it's more, I think, the impression that he's just not taking it seriously, that he right. knew it an inconvenience for himself. Well, and also he was able, you know, I mean, look, Andrew Cuomo, I think, did a terrible job in, in New York, and, and yet he was at least <laughs> able to portray himself as caring. Yeah. And, and so, I, you know, so, you, something else you said before, um, uh, when it came to judges, mm. Trump outsourced it to the Federalist Society. He it basically yeah. became, you know, play and plug, right? Plug and play. You just, you know, whatever, you know, they, they gave him a list. He put the list in. Everybody says that's actually pretty good. Um, imagine if he would have done the same thing with the coronavirus. In other words, just, said, you know, said, I trust the Federalist Society when it comes to judiciary. 
I'm going to trust this group of scientists and epidemiologists on this. We have a very, very different political environment right now. We also probably have a rather dramatically different death count. Now, I would not have voted for Donald Trump. I think the case against Donald Trump is overwhelming besides that. But it's hard not to think that he would be in a very different political position if he had treated the virus the way he treated the judiciary. Yeah, I think that if he had sort of got out of the way, you know, I mean, yeah. for a while when he was you know, trying to run the briefings himself and all that, which turned out to be a catastrophe, if he could have sort of stepped aside and, and done what you said, well, then we would have spent the last several months with effectively the face of the Trump administration being Fauci and the CDC and various scientists and things like that, which I suspect would have had a reassuring effect on people and also would have just by, you know, the uh, communicative property invested the Trump administration with more of a sense of uh, responsibility and seriousness and moral probity and intellectual probity than it has had. Instead, you know, he's going to, he's going into this election as essentially an unlucky and less successful version of Silvio Berlusconi. Ooh. But you know, Berlusconi was, was running Italy, which is in a real yeah. country. Right. It's a church. <laughs> country. Um, I love Italy. Don't get yeah. me wrong. Right. Uh, but, um, you know, Italy can have a Silvio Berlusconi. I love Silvio Berlusconi when he was in office. He was endlessly entertaining. Um, the United States of America can't be run by Silvio Berlusconi, much less a second rate Silvio Berlusconi imitator. Yeah, you, it, it's he, Silvio Berlusconi is entertaining unless he has nuclear weapons, right? Yeah. So, so in terms of the, this, I, I never thought I would say these words, but. I'm kind of missing Steve Bannon um, <laughs> uh, because you, you, one of the differences between 2016 and 20, uh, 2020 is that back in 2016, there was at least somebody in the room who was able to tell Donald Trump how to make a closing argument, right? How to stay on the script. This is what you're talking about. Um, the last day before the election, you're not threatening to stiff, you know, the, 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 the sound technician. Maybe you ought to talk about the Supreme Court a little bit more as, a pair, as opposed to this very weird uh, final tour that's that's left him exhausted, and of course, then we have this election eve stunner. Where, and, and I don't know how you feel about people who are the sort of the, the 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 Vichy members of the administration, but you know, Deborah Burks has been the one who you know, you know, hung on the longest. Uh, you know, even even Anthony Fauci at some point the Fauci and bargain you know, wore out, and he he was he was exiled. But she was there, you know, going on Fox and saying, you know, that nobody knows the science better than Donald Trump and everything. Well, now we're finding out that she's sent out a memo, you know, bluntly contradicting the president on just about everything on the threat, urging an all out response, warning against the rallies and, you know, good for her finally doing it. But wow, it seems late. Where were you? And yeah. we find this out the night before mm -hmm. the election. Thank you, Deborah Burks. But I, I mean, if this guy gets elected, what's he going to do? Is he going to throw out all the scientists? Is he going to fire Fauci? Is he going to fire Burks? Are we going to sit around with that, uh, you know, complete uh, crackpot uh, Scott Atlas? Is, is that is that our destiny? Maybe Peter Navarro. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, this. OK, by the way, we're talking about the, the, the rest of these people. I, I think yeah. one of the things to always keep in mind is that the United States of America is a country with very low personal savings rate. And these people are going to be looking for jobs. And uh, I think that what we're seeing right now is people deciding that there's not going to be jobs in the Trump administration to be had because there isn't going to be a Trump administration. And they are trying to uh, get some professional distance and get some of that stink off themselves. Yeah, it's a little bit late to get the stink off yourself if you waited until the day before the election. I mean, there are a lot of ways of getting the stink off yourself, but there are going to be a lot of people who I think it's going to dawn on them that having anything involving the Trump administration on their resume is is not necessarily a good deal. So I want to actually go back to this whole question of, you know, Trump being a man of good character and everything. And, mm -hmm. and the, and the, the phenomenon of Christians talking themselves into thinking that what he was Cyrus or King David and he yeah. was God's instrument. And even though he pays off porn stars, you know, he's he's going to be the vessel to restore, you know, Christian America and all that stuff. OK, so leave that aside. It's also interesting to me that there's an entire group of people who feel that that Donald Trump's fundamental amorality provides them cover, that it's moved the window of what constitutes a scandal. Do you know where I'm going on this? That the, his attraction to people who are all the other people who out there who are 
the the grifters and the you know the sketchy you know folks who who somehow think that he they can be under his umbrella where their their conduct which would or burn them exile any place else is suddenly acceptable and and I'm I'm thinking in the back of my mind just I'm going to I read this long Politico magazine article about Jerry Falwell Jr. and his wife. Have you seen this yet? No, I haven't looked at it. Oh, man, it's just like pour yourself a bourbon and read this thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you you, want to talk about, I mean, you know, come come for the, you know, three-way sex and stay for the absolute self-dealing nepotism and, 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 and grifting. And as you put it down, you go, okay, I get it now. I get why a thorough creep and crook like Jerry Falwell Jr. would think, that Donald Trump's great, that I'm going to, I'm going to associate himself with him. I'm going to pal around with, with someone like this because maybe the, for, for them, it's sort of the opposite of the stink wearing off. It's that the stink is so great that nobody's going to notice how badly yeah. they stink. Yeah. I think that, um, with the caveat here, of course, that Sigmund Freud was a, uh, intellectual fraud. Um, <laughs> but, well, he was, uh, he, uh, yeah, yeah. Stuff. he was, he was a bad scientist. Um, he was a poor scientist, I can guess what you could say. Um, but the concept of projection, I think, is actually kind of useful because my observation is, in fact, that people tend to generalize from their own characters. So people who are dishonest expect everyone to be dishonest. Uh, men who are unfaithful to their wives tend to be very, very jealous and assume that uh, their wives are going to be unfaithful to them. Uh, people who cheat and chisel and, and, and lie in business expect that everyone else does. And partly that's in order to offer themselves justification. Well, everyone else is doing it. I have to level the playing field for myself. We can't be gentlemen losers like Mitt Romney. Um, but part of it is people actually really believe that. Uh, and dishonest people believe that other people are like them. And I suspect that Falwell and people like that really believe that they live in a world that is populated largely by people like themselves. Um, instead of the truth, which is they live in a world that's populated about you know 25% by people yeah. like themselves. Uh, which is not a huge number, but it's not not nothing either. Uh, one of my great regrets, by the way, of my most recent uh, book and the smallest minority is that the one line Regnery made me take out was a great line about Jerry Falwell Jr., which I unfortunately cannot repeat here, but I'll I'll tell you about it some other time. Oh, well, you can repeat it here. No. Well, you, you think we're not going to get an explicit rating? We get an explicit rating all the time. <laughs> okay, I, I won't push you to this. So... But, and we, we we talked about the smallest minority. You've been on the podcast to, to discuss that book as yeah. as well, because, you know, we, we are living in. I, mean, I do think that the, one of the big challenges that we're going to face is not right versus left, but liberalism, small L versus illiberalism. Yeah. And and the challenge um, of against liberal democracy does not come exclusively from the left. And I think this is this is one of the things that right now people on the left don't want to hear this. They don't want to hear a both sides ism. Um, but once this is all over, I think we're going to have to confront the the illiberalism across the political spectrum, which, of course, was what you have been writing about. Yeah. And of course, that illiberalism doesn't only come from the state as well. You yes. know, it's a matter of employment life and you know, particularly in big corporations like you know Google and Microsoft and uh, J.P. Morgan and places like that to take a really aggressive kind of uh, political stamp toward their employees. Um, and, and toward other things as well. So I think that, yeah, you're probably right about that. Um, but I think that that is a conflict that happens mainly in the culture, not mainly in politics. Mm -hmm. I think this is definitely a case of, um, where society is heading is going to influence government a lot more than government going to influence where society is heading. Fair point. No, fair, fair point. Okay, so it is election day. Mm -hmm. People are going to be listening to this, and it's going to be on our permanent record. So um, if if we're completely wrong, and I think that Donald Trump is going to be defeated for re-election, um, I don't think it's going to be particularly close. I think there are going to be some states that are going to be nail biters. Uh, but do you want to talk about Texas? What do you think is going to happen in Texas down there? Because it, to me, it, as this has gone on, I've become more and more fascinated um, yeah. by the incredible votes in Texas, what's happening in Texas. Uh, the desperate uh, legal uh, m m maneuver down there to throw out 127,000 votes out of Democratic-leaning Harris County. Um, yeah. 
but but I also kind of feel that it's been the Lucy and the football, you know, the whole Beto O'Rourke thing, you know, the, you know, Beto, Beto, Beto. And, he, you know, he, he, come, he comes within three points, but he comes in with three points against one of the most detested figures in American politics, Ted Cruz. But so tell me what your gut sense tells you about Texas right now. Yeah, well, if I were betting my own money on it, I would bet that Trump wins. Mm -hmm. his, um, but it'll be closer than, than people want for it to be. Uh, Republicans in Texas are having a little bit of a come to Jesus moment, I think right now. And I think what really got their attention was that last time around in 2018, there were a number of Republican candidates who lost races in this state and lost races while they still had money in the bank. Yeah. Um, so the Republican party here had grown very complacent, very self-satisfied. Um, it has been for a long time to a non-trivial extent corrupt. And uh, these things are all um, kind of coming home to roost. But the, you know, the principal problem isn't, you know, people moving here from other states. Uh, in fact, there's been some reason to believe that um, the migration from California and such has been a net positive for Republicans in Texas because the people living, leaving California tend to be more conservative. Um, the problem mm. is uh, growing Hispanic population. Uh, Trump may actually do relatively well among uh, Hispanics in Texas. The and and Me the Mexican American population in Texas is uh, distinct. It's 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 socially and culturally quite different from say California. But um, the problem, of course, is cities and suburbs. You know, Texas has six of the nation's twenty-five biggest cities in it. It's got, I guess, two of the six largest metropolitan areas in it. It's an increasingly urban state, and the suburbs, particularly in places like Harris County and Dallas County, Tarrant County. Um, increasingly resemble the cities that they surround. Uh, you're seeing, you know, mm. essentially the, the Philadelphia pattern um, happening in Texas cities, where for a long time, those five counties where, you know, Philadelphia had Democratic turnout of about 117% on any given election. Yeah. And, uh, and then the other four, you know, suburban counties were pretty reliably Republican. Then, you know, Montgomery County went Democratic, then Delaware County went Democratic, and then Bucks County went Democratic. And, you know, eventually you lose the whole region. And I think we're seeing that around here, too, where, you know, Dallas County has been pretty overwhelmingly uh, Democratic for a long time. Um, but now you're seeing it in Tarrant County where Fort Worth is. And, uh, you know, you're seeing Democratic inroads in traditionally more conservative places like Collin County and uh, Williamson County, no relation. And uh, these uh, trends are very uh, should be very worrying for Republicans this year, certainly, but also in the long term. So, you know, Trump. Uh, won Texas with 52% of the vote in mm. 2016. Not a huge number. So he far outperformed in the neighboring states, in Oklahoma, in Arkansas, in Louisiana. I think in Oklahoma, he got 65%, something like that. And then, you know, in Wyoming, he was at almost 70% of the vote, I want to say, mm. something like that. So his performance in Texas wasn't very good to start with. And he underperformed the Republican House candidates in that same year by about five, five or six points. I think maybe five, now that I think about it. So he's not been a super strong candidate here in the past. So when we've got polling that shows them tied, as some highly regarded polls do, or polls that show Trump at a lead of less than 2%, I still would be surprised if he lost Texas this year, but I wouldn't be just shocked by it. Um, although I agree that um, this would be uh, a real wake-up call, I think, for conservatives and for the Republican Party, Although what they should be paying attention to is the fact that Democrats may win a majority in the Texas state house. Well, I was I was actually going to mention that because the down ballot implication, even if Trump wins Texas, uh, you have a bunch of Republican congressional seats that are uh, vulnerable in the areas you just described, and yeah. then of course there's the possibility of of the Democrats uh, taking control of the of the of the of the legislature, the the yeah. the, the House. So. Uh, there are a lot of long term consequences to what's going to happen today in Texas. Yeah. And I think it's a real sign of our times that you've got Republicans in Texas saying to themselves, well, thank God we don't have straight ticket voting. Yeah, I'll bet. I bet they do. I'm, I'm trying to think whether we still have uh, straight ticket voting. People don't, in Wisconsin, we had a long tradition of of splitting our votes. It was was kind of a thing. And then starting about 2010, um, the, it, that went away. It appeared to, you know, it was you know, total partisan voting. 
I think it came back in 2018, but it's going to be very interesting to see how how that plays out again. No, no, Texas has become this fascinating, you know, this fascinating story because you get the sense that the the future of the electoral college and of national politics is going to be playing out in the Sun Belt right now, uh, as as much as I think the you know the focus of the election needs to be on the on the upper Midwest. I mean, I think whatever happens, it's going you know the, the election tonight will be decided by Pennsylvania, Michigan. Wisconsin. Um, he holds he holds that blue wall. And um, if Biden, if Biden holds that blue wall, he can lose Texas. He can lose Florida. He yep. can lose North Carolina. I think he can even lose Arizona. Mm-hmm. Um, I have my, my map in front of me. But as long as he wins Pennsylvania and Michigan and Wisconsin, uh, it becomes very, very, very difficult for Donald Trump to get to uh, to 270. So I'm I'm a big believer in the blue wall. But I am absolutely fascinated by watching these numbers out of Texas and who these people are that are coming out and the numbers and the enthusiasm. It strikes me as really ironic that in the year in which the Republican Party becomes overtly and obviously the party of voter suppression and doing everything possible to make it harder to vote and harder to count votes, that you're having this voter backlash that's going to be, I mean, it's going to be something for, for historians to look at for a very long time. Yeah, and I also think that, um, and and this may be short lived. I'm not sure, but it's really difficult, I think, for Republicans to make the, um, you know, blue state model doesn't work uh, argument in Texas because you've got you know my alma mater, the University of Texas, in a very very liberal city in a very liberal county, um, which is governed as though it were a county in California, and it's putting out tens of thousands of graduates every year who are staying in Austin and getting good jobs and living good lives and perfectly happy. Uh, with their situation. So to tell some guy who just finished up at UT and went to work for Apple and is making $180,000 a year, you know, well, you've got no future. He's not buying that. He feels like he's got a pretty good future. And if you have Democrats governing you, you're going to be, you know, poor and have no job. He's saying, I've got Democrats governing me now and I'm doing fine. And so in a sense, Texas Republicans can be partly a victim of the state's success because people are doing pretty well in Houston, San Antonio, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth. You know, when uh, Cruz lost Fort Worth to uh, Beto, that left my hometown of Lubbock as the largest reliably Republican city in Texas. <laughs> Lubbock. Yeah. Really? Well, we, we're, we're going to find out a lot. Think how much smarter we're going to be 24 hours from now. And, and, and of course, I'm waiting for all the pundits to extend. Well, of course, this was what was, was going to uh, to happen. So Kevin Williamson, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. I appreciate it very much. Uh, Kevin's piece in uh, National Review, hell no, the case against Trump in 2020 is a lot like the case against Trump in 2016, but bolstered by the accumulation of evidence and experience. It is, as usual, Kevin, a great take. Oh, well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Good talking to you. And thank you for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. This is Election Day 2020, and we will be back tomorrow to talk about what the hell just happened.